From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guang. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. On March the 25th, Russia said that the first phase of what it calls a special military operation in Ukraine had been mostly completed. According to Russian senior military official Sergei Rojovsky, Moscow has almost annihilated Ukraine's air and naval forces, while Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said Kyiv's resistance has dealt, quote-unquote, a powerful blow to Russia. Meanwhile, the U.S. and the EU have announced a major gas deal on Friday. A month and several talks on, there is still no sign of a ceasefire. As shelling and fighting continue, casualties and refugees are now topping the agenda. And the warfare is far beyond the battlefield, as the war of information goes on as well. The Russian Defense Ministry said that just, a, just over a thousand Russian soldiers died in battle, while the Ukrainians said that the number is actually higher. What's the end game for Moscow to help us navigate through the latest developments? We're joined at this hour by Joe Bo, Senior Fellow of the Center for International Security and Strategy from Tsinghua University. Senior Colonel Joe, welcome to the Hub. Um, I want to begin by asking you about the latest on the battlefield. Russia said its objective have shifted, saying that, um, you know, quote unquote, our forces will focus now on the primary objective, which is the full liberation of Donbass. Do you think Russia is scaling back from its more ambitious targets, such as, you know, capturing Kyiv? Well, uh, this, uh, such kind of remarks are most interesting in that they are somewhat contradictory to the announcement by President Putin uh, in the beginning before the so-called special operation because he clearly talked about uh, uh, overthrowing the regime uh, in Kiev. So now we found that the strategic purpose of Russia seemed to scale back uh, into focus on Donbass. This is a sea change. Because uh, previously you have seen Russian troops uh, attacking uh, Ukraine from uh, different directions, uh, in the north, in the south, and in the east. But now it's uh, uh, become uh, clearly focused in one region, uh, Donbass, which is in the east. So what does that mean? Does that uh, suggest that uh, uh, because of the heavy losses of Russian troops, uh, therefore their ambition has to be scaled back? Or is it simply a kind of pretension uh, just to buy the time and then before another, you know, uh, offensive attack. Uh, we don't know. We have to, to see. Yeah, initially, uh, many would speculate that uh, Kyiv or Kiev would be, uh, you know, besieged by Russian troops. Uh, you know, uh, Putin himself said its goal is to, quote unquote, denazify the country. And at this point, what do you think is the end game for Moscow? Well, uh, right now, the Russian troops are still within artillery range of Kiev, but they sim simply cannot uh, uh, take Kiev. Uh, so I believe um, the, the losses are really heavy because uh, fighting on foreign territory, uh, you have a lot of problems such as adequate logistics supply, such as the morale of your soldiers, who definitely uh, would not be higher than those local people who are just fighting for their own country. And um, the problem is the Russian troops uh, seem to be, uh, well, the Russian troops are certainly not overwhelming in terms of number. Because uh, on such a ground warfare, you have to have an overwhelming yeah, a number vis-a-vis uh, -vis your enemies. But uh, the Ukrainian forces uh, uh, have uh, uh, nearly uh, 200,000 troops, while Russia uh, owning deploy about uh, 150,000 troops. Well, sometimes the figures varies, but this is what I have learned uh, from uh, uh, the latest uh, report in the newspaper. Right, Senior Colonel Joe, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden just attended a NATO summit, and more support for Ukraine was pledged by himself as well as many NATO leaders. Uh, what specific military support do you think uh, can come from the U.S. and NATO? Well, I, uh, I definitely understand that he would just go there to show solidarity of the West, to show uh, the, uh, the great effort of NATO, but uh, he still uh, has been trying a balance. Uh, what is his balance? His balance is never send American soldiers to the soil of Ukraine and never send uh, NATO troops to the soil of Ukraine because this might trigger uh, a direct confrontation with a nuclear power the largest nuclear uh, country in the world. 
because so far uh, he has actually made a lot of efforts uh, with one clear purpose to avoid the direct confrontation. For example, he denied uh, the, the, the request from uh, Poland to, to transfer MiG-29, and he actually denied uh, setting up a fly zone. And of all the weapons he has sent so far to Ukraine, they're all defensive in nature rather than offensive. So in this way, I believe uh, he would go there to boost the morale, to show so-called solidarity, but still he would uh, keep the bottom line, that is, uh, not have a direct confrontation with Russia. Right, but on the other hand, Ukrainian President Zelensky accused Russia of having used uh, phosphorus bombs on civilians. Uh, President Joe Biden announced that the civilians, uh, the alliance, would respond to Russia if chemical weapons are used in Ukraine. Uh, of course, so far, Brussels and Washington have stopped short of engaging with Russia in war. Uh, do you think things could change? Well, the, these are simply speculations because NATO talk about uh, the possibility of Russia launching a nuclear attack, a chemical attack, or biological attack. Uh, these could be, uh, could be the, the worries, but they could also be used as a pretext to just uh, smear on the, uh, uh, the reputation of Russia. Because all these weapons uh, are just uh, weapons of mass destruction, if uh, they, they use it, if Russia use it, as uh, President Putin has uh, threatened uh, with a very thing well, it would be a heavy blow to the international image of, of Russia. Because Russia it itself actually has pledged uh, no first use of nuclear weapons with uh, China, because China and Russia's relationship are good. So Russia and China actually have a, this kind of a, a natural arrangement of no first use of nuclear weapon. But the, the truth is that normally, if a country is confident about his conventional force, which is overwhelming, he could just announce no first use. In 1982, Leonid Brezhnev actually announced no first use of nuclear weapon as a Soviet leader, because at that, at that time, the Soviet leaders were very much confident about the, the uh, superiority of the conventional force. And, then, and uh, the, the NATO was very much hesitant yeah, to announce such a kind of uh, uh, no first use policy. But in fact, I think that right now the world has a very interesting question because the United States will very soon publish a nuclear posture review. But uh, from what I read, they probably will still uh, refrain from making a clear-cut, no first use uh, pledge. This is uh, very much sad in that China's policy of no first use is not that very far from that of the United States, because uh, according to Joe Biden, the sole use of nuclear weapon is for deterrence. So that means uh, unless and until you are attacked, you would not use nuclear weapons. So why don't you just uh, make announcement of no first use? This is the most uh, realistic uh, uh, option at this moment. This is a silver lining, yeah, among the dark clouds. Sure, sure. Uh, Senior Colonel Joe, we know that President Vladimir Putin's chief spokesperson, uh, Peskov, r refused to rule out uh, the use of nuclear weapons at this point, uh, especially if Russia faces what he calls an existential threat. Um, do you think Russia is bluffing, or is that you know still a largely deterrent strategy, like you said? Well, this is exactly what I said. If you are confident about uh, your, the, super, your, the superiority of your conventional force, then you don't have to rely on nuclear weapons. Because right, right now, the Russian armed forces, uh, compared to its heydays during the Cold War, uh, is much more weak. But uh, Russia is still the country with the largest nuclear arsenal. So it just relies on its nuclear arsenal. Uh, so uh, President Putin's remarks about, uh, you know, about uh, the so-called uh, consequences uh, that other countries might suffer, or about his, uh, uh, his instruction to raise the combat readiness of uh, his nuclear forces, actually a reflection of that. Uh, but maybe it is just a strategy, the strategy of escalating before de-escalating. Senior Colonel Joe, let's talk about the US and NATO. Joe Biden attending the summit at NATO said that uh, the transatlantic alliance has never been uh, you know, more united. Um, do you think the alliance is somehow, how, somehow consolidated because of Ukraine? Yes, of course it is consolidated because uh, according to French President 
uh, Emmanuel Macron, actually NATO, uh, is brain dead. And this kind of uh, Russian's uh, beat aggression or beat a special operation in Ukraine has certainly revived uh, NATO. But as a, still, the question is, what is the use of NATO? Uh, actually, Russia's uh, action is very much a response to five Eastern world expansion of NATO after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So it is a very much a NATO expansion that actually has a triggered uh, Russia's uh, uh, military operation. Or in other words, uh, uh, NATO's uh, policy has backfired. So right now, we, we can almost imagine what would happen in Europe. After this hot war, definitely there is a cold war. Because uh, countries, uh, uh, European countries, definitely will have a huge investment uh, in the in the defense, uh, and Germany is a, uh, is a clear example because Germany uh, used to be reluctant about uh, military spending, but now all of a sudden, within a month, it has uh, spent uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 billion euros in defense. And this is an example. The only question is: Would such kind of massive military investment strengthen the so-called uh, European strategic autonomy? which so far is a French slogan, or it would strengthen NATO. But if, because these are just like two directions, if it goes down to strengthen Europe, maybe the transatlantic alliance will suffer. It will be weakened rather than strengthened. But maybe it's not a bad thing, because in this regard, the United States actually have more resources focused on Indo-Pacific, which is a primary challenge. So, Senior Colonel Joe, you're saying that there's probably going to be a Cold War following the hot war in Ukraine, right? What could that well, Cold I, War look like? Y y yes, yes. And I personally believe there will be two Cold Wars. One is uh, after the, this hot war in Europe. Another uh, is already in, in the Asia Pacific because of the uh, Trump's uh, great power competition. So, great power competition actually has ushered in a Cold War. People nowadays do not talk about a Cold War because the, even the leaders do not want to talk about a, a new Cold War. But let me ask you a question. Biden's uh, policy toward China is very much a follow-up of Trump's policy toward China. Basically, it is a extreme competition short of war. But if a competition is already extreme, isn't it a Cold War? What else can it be? Because it is only one or two scrapes away from a hot war. So definitely we have entered another new Cold War. Yeah, I would think that many experts would agree that uh, what Biden or, or Trump have done uh, is tantamount to a Cold War when you think about what Washington has been doing to China. And then, like you said, the military budget is another thing topping the agenda of the NATO summit. So far, only 10 out of 30 NATO members met the guideline of spending 2% of their GDP on defense in 2021. And this year, with the crisis in Ukraine, do you foresee an increase in defense spending in NATO? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, because of this, uh, this war in Ukraine, previously, no matter how the United States uh, want uh, NATO country to increase uh, the defense spending, it is very difficult. Uh, actually, uh, the United States would have showed uh, about 70% of uh, of NATO's uh, expenditure. So therefore, all the American presidents uh, would want NATO countries to actually spend more on defense spending. Uh, but because of this new situation, definitely uh, the European country will spend more on defense, uh, defense spending. Because in the Cold War, Britain actually would, could spend about 5 to 6% of GDP uh, on national defense. Right now, because of the new situation, uh, I have no doubt uh, many countries will just uh, uh, increase the uh, defense spending to meet the, this so-called, uh, this uh, standard of 2% GDP on defense. Finally, let's talk about the Ukraine-Russia negotiations that have been ongoing for a month, or for th three weeks, rather. Uh, President Zelensky said he's willing to talk directly with Vladimir Putin on the question of, you know, Ukraine not joining NATO. Uh, Zelensky said he's also willing to talk about the status of the Donbass, region as well as Crimea. Um, when do you think we can expect negotiations to bring about uh, a ceasefire? 
Well, I think that it more depends on how President Putin thinks. Because uh, President Lezinsky, of course, wants to have a talk, right? Because only through conversation, he could just find uh, possible compromises. But it's the, the strategic objectives of President Putin that really matter. Because it depends on what kind of a, a plan President Putin really wants. But right now, we, we, as we talked in the beginning, I have seen a shift uh, in the strategic priority uh, from a kind of a, a full-blown all-out war to uh, Russia's focus in Do Donbas region. So it's very much a question of how Russia would consider what they have, what it has achieved, or what it it can achieve in days to come. All right, Senior Colonel Jobo, thanks so much for coming on our show and for sharing your insights with us this evening. Thanks so much. Thank you.